From Content360, this is the State of Client Acquisition. Welcome to the State of Client Acquisition. This is your host, Michael Bohannes. In this podcast, we go down and deep into all aspects of organic B2B client acquisition for coaches, consultants, and small B2B CEOs. And we have a special focus on LinkedIn. And we cover the entire acquisition process from offer creation to positioning to content, outbound and selling on Zoom. And we want to make this all about you, the listener. So if you have a question, please go to stateofclientacquisition.com to submit a question. So in today's episode, I have a real treat for you. I managed to get Chris Weir on the show to talk all things video. He's a LinkedIn video marketer from Chicago and uh, his LinkedIn videos are pure gold. I mean, he provides a ton of value in them. They're really nicely scripted and visually really, really compelling. So please definitely follow him. Uh, The link to his profile is going to be in the show notes. And in our conversation, we don't only cover what is his recipe for success with his videos, but Crucially, Chris also took the time to critique a listener's video and also one of my videos. And I got a lot of valuable information from it. And there was one main takeaway that I will be able to implement right away. So if you are doing video on LinkedIn, I'm sure there's going to be plenty of good nuggets in this episode. Now, if you're only listening to this on a podcast app, you'll still be able to get a lot of value from it. But for an even better experience, I recommend that you go and watch this episode on YouTube. The link is going to be in the show notes or simply go to YouTube and search for Ep5 State of Client Acquisition, episode five of the State of Client Acquisition podcast. Great. And with that, without further ado, let's get right into this week's episode. Okay, cool. Today, I'm very excited to have a very special guest on this episode. His name is Chris Weyer, and he helps startups and mid-sized businesses build their brands via video. And his tagline is turn viewers into buyers. So he definitely fits with the narrative of this podcast. Chris, great to have you on the State of Client Acquisition. Thank you for having me. This is very cool. Awesome. Awesome. So Chris, I noticed you, we, I think we spoke back in September or October last year for the first time. I simply noticed you because your videos just simply stand out, right? Your videos are polished. Every word sits, you know, you don't, you don't wing it like most people do even, um, even uh, like I do most of the time. So uh, before (laughs) we get into the nitty gritty of LinkedIn video, can you tell me, is this the type of video the most common one you help your clients do, or do you also do more typical like ads or corporate videos and so on? What is your, what is your field of business? So yeah, I started Cleaver Creative uh, eight years ago. And for the most part, a lot of our business has always been animation videos, explainer videos, um, Mm -hmm. sales videos that would be shown during presentations. Uh, We still do some of that. Uh, but I knew that I really needed to get systematic about marketing. And so last year, just before the beginning of last year, um, so end of 2019, I started making videos on LinkedIn. And um, from my time running a startup, uh, you get a sense of traction like what does traction really look like? What does it really feel like? You can show somebody your product or your service and they go, oh, cool, I'll think about it. (laughs) But if you show somebody your product or service and they go, oh man, that's awesome. I want that right now. Even if they can't afford it, Mm -hmm. you know that's traction. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. that was the kind of reaction that I got from my first videos on LinkedIn. So I said, okay, clearly I need to triple my efforts here and really be very systematic about creating great content here. Mm -hmm. And it's been, it's been working well. When was that? When did you make that switch? I think I put my first video up maybe in September of 2019. Okay. And then I got really systematic about it probably about a month later and started Mm -hmm. saying come hell or high water. One video is going up every single week. Okay. 
Okay. Now, speaking of that, you, you post once a week. I think it's a good entry point here. Now, most LinkedIn gurus, including myself, if I may call myself that, uh, recommend a more frequent schedule. Like mo some people do even three times a day. That's me on, on most weeks. Uh, there's a couple of them who post less frequently. But what's your, what's your content philosophy and how's it going for you? And do you recommend your clients to do the same? Right. Um, by the way, are we are we recording video as well as audio? Yes, we are recording video, and we will share screen soon. So okay, super. Um, yes. So I came up with this recipe of one video a week um, for my own usage, and it has worked. And part of the reason why it works for me is because my um, my ideal client is small to medium sized business, usually bigger than a, than a solopreneur, um, ideally has 10 to 50 employees at least, and can afford, you know, several thousand dollars a month for a service. Um, so it really depends on, on who your ideal client is and what your service or product is. If you're selling something that is a little less expensive, and maybe it's a one-time payment, then you have to market more. That's why you see more ads for, you know, Coca-Cola, because it costs 75 cents. Uh, then you do see ads for, you know, high-end SaaS software, because they need to sell less of them. So the, the key really is the, the, the higher your price tag, the fewer messages you need, but the higher quality they need to be. So interesting. I've never thought of it this way, that it's actually a question of customer lifetime value. Now, I wonder, is that is that universally so? Because I do see, I'm just looking at my market, my competitors. It really is all around the place. Some people are posting frequently like I do. Others do it less frequently. But okay, it's a very interesting observation. I hadn't really thought of that. Did you arrive at this at this conclusion? When did you come up with this? Um, it was mostly just intuitive um, knowing my market. I mean, I think that the tricky part for some folks is that, um, I think, actually I think the tricky part for everyone is that real true B2B sales has mainly only existed through analog channels until now. Like video has only been allowed on LinkedIn for like three years, which is crazy. Mm. <laughs> it's crazy that it took them that long. And I think part of the reason was they wanted to make sure their algorithm was right so that it wasn't getting clogged up with all kinds of nonsense that like wasn't business oriented. Mm. That said, so, so this is still a really, really new place to play. And a lot of people are just trying to figure it out how it should work for them. Mm -hmm. um, so basically I came up with the, the one video a week recipe, knowing businesses that I've worked for, larger businesses that I've worked for, understanding that customer persona pretty uh, intimately because I've worked with them and knowing their time that they have on their hands and the types of content that they need to see. And knowing that also a little bit about brand and that you know, if you're not respect, you know, reflecting yourself positively, you can reflect yourself negatively. And that can come across as just being the guy at the party who's just talking, talking, talking all about, you know, all the time. If you're providing value all that time, then, then you're golden. You're great. Mm -hmm. But the problem I see some people having is they don't quite know what to talk about. So they just say a whole bunch of stuff and they don't really track what's working and they just keep experimenting and they're not harsh enough critics on themselves as to knowing what is the metric I'm really after. Mm. You know, if I'm just looking to build up my followers and just get this huge following, okay, that's, that's, that's a one way to go. And there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but if your goal really is to be getting sales from business owners, you really have to look at your track record of the last three months and go, how many sales did I get? Mm -hmm. Of course. How many leads did I get? Um, so that's kind of where I came from, from knowing this or feeling this was that was the right recipe. Um, yeah. 
Okay, it's very, very interesting. I just as you were talking, I came up with a counter example. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with him, Chris Walker. He's yes. running uh, Refine Labs and he posts a video every day, right? He sometimes right. even experimented with doing it more often, but then ultimately he arrived at that once a day. But he actually, I think he did it every day. So every week, every yeah, day of the week, so seven days a week. And uh, that's his recipe. And his average, I think, customer lifetime value is going to be in the hundreds of thousands. He charges 15000 a month. So it, this is not to disprove your hypothesis. It is working for you. I think it's just for our listeners to keep that in mind that there are really many, many paths to glory. And I keep telling my clients as well that there's just there's a couple of avenues that don't work and there's a couple of them that do work of course the ones that do work there's fewer of them but if you just look at one particular model of someone who is obviously successful with their content and just emulate that and see if it works for you give it two months there's for example another guy i really like jason varna i don't know if you're familiar with him he only posts text posts one a day he has hundreds of likes tons of engagement and he told me that he is getting really good business from that there's just so many different paths towards content success on linkedin and you are showing us one of them so i right. this is not i don't want to contradict you in any way it's that's the great thing is that we can simply let many flowers bloom and yours right. is obviously blossoming quite nicely yeah i i, I talk to folks all the time and you know, I say like, if this is working for you, take my advice, don't take my advice, whatever you want. If it's working for you, don't change anything. Yeah. If you're doing stuff and it's not working, then you need to keep experimenting and see what is going to work for you. Mm -hmm. And so that's really all it about, it's about is like, yeah, I know Chris Walker's stuff. Uh, I'm always impressed by him. And when you look at his numbers, it's working. So it's like, don't change anything, Yeah, you know? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. So when you say it's working, what would you say is a benchmark for when people should change their approach? Like, let's say you do um, for three months, you post a video daily and you have uh, whatever, five, seven, 10,000 followers. What would you expect should come out of that? What is like a benchmark figure that you would expect? So that's um, really interesting. Uh, I see people with 20,000 followers and they're posting videos and their videos are getting three likes. Mm -hmm. And so the key really to me in my mind on LinkedIn, like the brilliance of LinkedIn is that it is a lot of B2B selling. So you're really niching down to an audience. And so if your target, you know, ideal customer is, uh, you know, warehouse owners, there's going to be a very small number of them. And you basically just want to build your network full of warehouse owners, connect with them, form relationships, and then make content for them. So really the key is to start with your end goal in mind. What do you want to get out of this? You know, if you're trying to get sales, then, then at the end of those three months, you need to really look and see, did any of these things turn into a conversation? Did any of these posts turn into a conversation? Did any of these turn into a lead? And then track and look and say, why? How did that happen? Ultimately, I think you can look at success on LinkedIn by looking at the depth of the conversations in your posts. And if you're having good, legitimate conversations about the area where you're an expertise, Clients are going to see that. Prospects are going to see that. They're not going to comment themselves, but they're going to go and start looking at your comments and seeing what you're replying to people about, um, seeing that you are the expert and know what you're talking about, and they're going to file you away. And six weeks later, when they do need your service, they're going to remember you and come back to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. But you wouldn't be able to kind of share, this is what after three months of posting a video a week, you should expect to have at least like whatever, 10, 10 good leads a month, five good leads a month, right. find a month. Is this something that you, where you would tell a client of yours, hmm, we need to right. adjust. Right. So this is what I tell folks is, is you need to know if you don't have a sales process before going into this, it's going to be very hard to track if it's working. 
Like if you don't, if you're not making cold calls or sending out emails or something where you're going, oh, I did this for six months and I made one sale, you know, your sales cycle is six months doing that. Mm -hmm. If you don't know what your sales cycle is, it's going to be harder to know yeah. if this works and how well it works. This is not going to accelerate anyone's sales cycle. Everybody wants a silver bullet. Like I put out one video and then it just goes viral. And then I start getting clients and everyone loves the video. It's like, it doesn't work that way. Yeah. Uh, regular marketing doesn't work that way. So B2B marketing is not going to work that way. Um, so it's not going to accelerate your sales cycle. But once you get your first lead, once you get this first interested little bite from a fish where it's like, oh, that person wanted to get on a call with me, you know that that much work led up to that lead. Mm -hmm. And I would think that three months is reasonable depending on how good your content is. Um, to get that first lead. Um, but, you know, I have clients that their products are, or their service is starts at $100,000. So that client usually is about a year to 18 month sales cycle. Mm -hmm. But it's going to take them a year to 18 months to close somebody. And it might take them six months to eight months to 12 months to get a real tangible lead. Okay. Okay. So of course it cannot be extrapolated to any and all kind of situation, but three months is probably a good time frame in which you need to see some decent engagement that the right people are engaging with your stuff. I think this is something that many people underestimate the fact that it needs to be the right people doing this. Like very often I see people who have insane engagement and then I spoke to some of them and they have no results from it, no leads, no clients, because they post like general purpose, inspirational, motivational stuff. And all the while they are selling to warehouse owners, you know, extreme example, right? Right. And so it's just, yeah, you're going to get pretty much everybody, every rando on LinkedIn is going to like it, but are you really getting through to that right audience? So if after three months, not somebody from your ideal target audience has engaged and has maybe engaged substantially in the comment section and you did not get a single person approaching you about those videos about that content there's probably time that you need to change tack right okay. and that doesn't mean you need to throw everything out but you need to look at what worked what didn't work and i also tell my clients this like video works you know, we, we make sales, we, we do business based upon who we, who we want to work with. And we choose them by knowing, liking, and trusting them. We need those three categories. Video does all three pretty well. Um, but the trust part for some people's products and services can be very complicated to share. If you've got a complicated service that has a lot of moving pieces that is very customized, you don't necessarily need to be using video to talk about all of that. You can write an article, you can share a case study through a PDF. You can put content out there that is a little bit easier for people to engage with on their own and then use your videos for the no and the like part. So I, I see that all the time as well. These folks that are like, yeah, putting out these inspirational posts, they're getting tons of likes, they're getting tons of shares. Everyone's like, oh, you're so great but they never talk about what is your business. And it doesn't have to be through video. It could be through uh, an article. Mm. Um, at some point you need to get my attention to be like, Hey, you know, I'm the guy that you love that does all those funny, you know, funny dances. This is really what I do. I work with people doing this thing. So now, you know, both parts of me. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Fascinating stuff. Okay, so do you, Chris, do you actually measure how much of your business comes from different sources? Do you do outbound? Do you have anything systematic referrals and so on just to kind of know where you're coming at from this? Yeah, I think you, you mentioned that um, earlier. And if I had to put numbers on it, you know, I would say now 90% of my new clients are coming through LinkedIn. And I would say that probably... It's maybe 40% inbound, 40% outbound, and 20% referrals. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the outbound strategy, I don't know if I shared this video with you, but I'll put it in the, in the chat here. 
Um, and if you want to put it in the show notes, it, it might be good for people to see. Mm -hmm. um, it's a video I made last year that I just outlined my exact inbound outbound strategy on LinkedIn. Okay. And you can do this through spreadsheets like I do, or you can do it using Sales Navigator. Um, I would recommend Sales Navigator if you have clients that are a little harder to find. My clients, for the most part, are people who are business owners who are already making videos or interested in making videos. So it's a bit easier to, for me to find them. Mm -hmm. um, but you can search by role and things on Sales Navigator. But basically, what I really recommend doing is um, rather than doing cold calls, uh, because nobody likes to do those, do a video intro. So mm -hmm. once you've connected with somebody, you've had a short conversation with them, make them a video intro and try then provide them some value as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, and for me, that's just simply talking about people's videos that I see on LinkedIn, talking about what they're doing well, talk about where they can improve, introduce myself, talk about my business for 30 seconds, and then just say, hey, if you want to get on a call, let me know. Mm -hmm. And then usually the people who, who follow up from there, um, if we get on a call, then I will tag them in a video that I have coming out that week. And that further kind of shows them that I am an expert in my field, that I, I walk the walk, I know exactly how this stuff works. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I would really recommend dovetailing these two strategies together. So you're really integrating both sides of your content. Okay. So when you say dovetailing, it's you send them an introductory video where you send them like, you know, just a friendly hello. In your case, you probably would give them some feedback about their videos. Some, let's say, is it also critical feedback? Do you sometimes say something that they should improve upon? Yeah, it's usually like a compliment sandwich. Yeah. It's usually like, you know, you're yeah. doing great. I'm impressed that you're using video. Here's what you're doing well. Here's what I would change, da 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 da, da And then just say, you know, keep, keep it up. It's going good for you. So keep doing it. Okay. And then if they respond, you then tag them in one of your next posts. Is that correct? Usually the breakdown is like, I have a virtual assistant who helps me source these people. So she finds them. I try and go through about five a day. I comment on a recent post and just see if there's something that I can add to the recent post. They like that comment or they reply, then we connect to them. And then usually a week or two later, I will send them a video intro uh, because we're already connected. I'll just say, hey, we're, you know, I'm a new connection of yours. Just wanted to try and give you some value here, da, 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 da. And then if they do want to get on a call, even if there's really no chance for them to become, um, you know, a client, usually then after that call, I will still tag them in a video that week and just say, hey, shout out to this person. What do you think? And it's just kind of a nice, like, if you do that once for somebody, if you tag somebody once in a video and you've like made a great impression already, they kind of see it as a value add. If you're just tagging random people, you know, just to kind of get views and likes and stuff, people start to feel like that feels a little spammy. Mm -hmm. So it's really about the knowing the person and knowing how they're going to react to it. Mm. I, I, I call it hostage tagging when 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 you're just you know randomly tagging i get this sometimes and it's really annoying and i then just to spite them then i don't engage just so right. that they get uh, punished by the linkedin algorithm because right. that's an important thing to know not sure if all the listeners know that if you tag someone who then does not engage with that post LinkedIn is going to significantly deprioritize the distribution of that post. So make sure that you're only tagging people who are friendly towards you and who hopefully are not on holiday uh, at, right. that, at that time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Very interesting. Just a quick uh, detail on what you said. Did you say that you would even take calls with somebody who is not going to become a client? You know, it's it, uh, sometimes you don't know. You know what I mean? Like I, I, what I was saying was I will still tag somebody in a video even if it looks like at the end of the call we're not going to become clients mm. they're not going to become a client of mine oh got it okay so at the end of the call you realize it. got it right right, mm -hmm. right okay well that actually reminded me when we talked for the first time in september or october you gave me this suggestion that i should also send these videos out where i give some uh, the compliment sandwich as you call it and i did that and it, it just, it landed really, really well. People very much enjoyed it. So that was really good advice. 
However, and that's something I wanted to also to ask you about whether you are tracking this, whether this particular method is giving you good, good amount of business, because I did this now a hundred times and I didn't, I did only got one client out of that. And that was just the ROI on this was not very good. My text messages that I send my outbound written, just purely written, right. it works better. Works better. Yeah. Yeah. Again, it- like it's gonna be different for everybody. It's gonna absolutely be for everybody. Um, you have a nicer and- face. That's it. People just people just like your face more. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's the thing: is that um, it could be it could be that I'm just more handsome. No, um, very it likely. Could be your it could be your your lead gen source. Like you could need to be spending more time qualifying the leads before you make the video message Mm -hmm. that could be the thing as in Um, starting the conversation with them or just judging based on some of their profile attributes whether they're a good lead looking looking at their looking at their profile attributes um and it could be an integration thing between your text messages and your video intros Mm. where you're qualifying people more before you take the time to make that video intro. Mm-hmm. You know, you're asking more questions through text or through your, your interactions with them to qualify them before you spend that time and make that video for them. Yeah, absolutely. Great, so I was also thinking, I wanted to ask you the following, what do you then actually do for your clients? Because there's many people who can do video editing out there, but with you, people get way more than that. Obviously you consult them on what their video strategy should be. And give us a couple of examples. What do you do for your clients? Sure. So yeah, it's, it's really become kind of a fun place to play for me because previously a lot of our work was like, Hey, we need this sales video. I'm like, okay, we'll make you a sales video. Hey, we need this marketing video. We need this communications video. Okay. We'll make that video. And now it really has become more uh, of an ability to be able to advise people and help them brainstorm about the kinds of content they should be creating and help them make that content. So a lot of times what that looks like is working with a business owner, um, doing a discovery call, creating a whole list of ideas that they're going to be passionate and interested in talking about every week. Um, Getting on a shooting call where I'll be on zoom like this and I'll coach them through shooting their first four videos. Mm -hmm. Um, Generally we do that for three months. And then what I recommend doing is launching a podcast. Once you've gotten comfortable on camera doing these shorter form pieces of content then I think the next phase really is uh, launching your podcast where you're doing a little bit longer form content. Um, You feel comfortable talking on camera. You feel comfortable talking into a microphone and you can then mine that content for tons of posts. And so then we are taking those posts and turning them into posts that they can use every day, all year round. Mm -hmm. Um, And usually what I continue to recommend is only going up to two posts a week on LinkedIn, no more. uh, And then putting daily posts out on uh, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Great. So that's very clear. Do you also go so far to really discuss with them the individual script and what they should say, or is this too much detail? Yeah. Do you? Yep. Mm Yeah. Basically what we do is we brainstorm the ideas. They draft um, a, a rough outline of their script. I review it and then we get on a shoot and, and I don't recommend using a script to, to get started because it can come off very robotic and unnatural. Um, so what I recommend doing is writing the script, looking at it before you go and then put it out of your mind and just try and deliver it naturally to camera. Okay. So no re that what, Shay Rowbottom, for example, recommends is that you just have the script next to you, you read out one sentence, and then you look at the paper again. And for that, you do a jump cut. So that's why you have from each sentence to each sentence as jump cuts. You don't recommend that? Um, I don't. Uh, Obviously, it works for Shay. So she's going to recommend what works for her. Um, My goal really is to work with B2B people. 
And, um, you know, I think consultants need help and I do enjoy working with them, but for people who are selling B2B, um, it needs to come across a little bit. I think it come, needs to come across a little bit more naturally and, um, and it's okay if it's a little bit more thoughtful and maybe even if it's a little bit more slow, uh, because if you're really making rich content, um, people are going to watch it. Uh, one of my, one of the best examples I have of this is a client who I have who does um, uh, process improvement consulting. And we actually did a live shoot last year and I recorded him and he was kind of, he was kind of complaining about one of his clients and um, I just hit record button because I knew that there was great stuff there. And, and when we put it together, it's about the 60 second, 90 second clip of him talking about one of his clients and going, you know, they're doing the wrong thing. We've told them to do the right thing. Their employees want us to do the right thing. And you don't just listen to the managers and go, okay, we're just going to do whatever you say. You push back and you say, why are we doing this? Like we need to change. And the reaction that he got from that video was like, the best that he's had from all of his vlogs because people awesome. are just like in it with him. They're like feeling his passion. They're feeling what he really believes is, is powerful about his business. And that's, I think the most important thing in creating videos for yourself is that it's passionate. You believe it and it's okay. It's imperfect. If it's imperfect, you know, mm. for some of us, it's okay. If it's even boring. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> because yeah. you really want to niche down to the right audience. Absolutely. And this is why one of the reasons why I like Chris Walker is that if you're not in his space, his stuff is supremely boring and just very unexciting. He talks about very detailed, arcane, you know, acronyms written stuff that is very difficult to penetrate for anyone who's not a real marketing, even like B2B SaaS marketing specialist. So it's just for the right people, anything that appears to the outside world to be boring for the right people is going to be just that goal that you need to mine. Right. And that's the other real piece that people have a hard time wrapping their heads around is they want to talk about themselves. Obviously, that's why we're doing this, right? I want to talk about myself. I want to talk about my business. That's fine. But nobody really cares about my business. They care about their business. Yeah. Um, but the other piece is... I just lost my train of thought. I was doing so good there. <laughs> It'll come back to me. No worries. We can we can come back to it. Uh, maybe this is a good theme to 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 keep riffing on. What other things do you see people do wrong the most often, and what are do you think consequential mistakes? Yes. In video. Um, that, that, that's where I was headed with it is that people want to talk about themselves and you have to, you have to talk about the problems of your client, how you're solving them in a way that's palatable for them. But then in addition to that, and this is what was made me think about it was the Chris Walker comment was he's tapping into this network of marketers of his quote unquote competitors and he's getting them involved in the conversation. So you want to make content for both. You want to make content for your ideal customer. And you want to make content that gets other people in your industry involved so that they feel like they can add to the conversation. You can add to their opinions. You can have little discussions and arguments, even if you want to. You can keep it civil. But that's the kind of content you want to be making is stuff that engages with your core customer and also with your quote unquote competitors. Absolutely. And honestly, one of the reasons I wanted to have you on is because we are operating in very similar markets. We're not directly competitors, but arguably a client might be deciding between either one of us, right? So right. there is a certain level of, of competition, but the main reason why I wanted to have you on is that you know what you're doing and you are doing great stuff and your audience is, is similar to mine, right? And, and, and you have a lot of very valuable information to share. So I 100% agree with that. For sure. Yeah, yeah I appreciate it. It's, uh, and, and that's the thing is that once you really, I think you probably share this, um, this mindset of getting out of this competitor mindset and realize the people that get attracted to your content are going to want to support you. They're going to want to send you business if they can. They're going to mm -hmm. want to like, 
help your content, you're helping their content. And the people who look at things as having, oh, I can't do that because that's my competitor, self-select themselves out of the process. Yeah, yeah. Because you, you just cannot do this completely alone. You need a network of people that um, are have your best interest in mind. And that actually is part of what makes it fun as you can create more content. You build mm -hmm. this network of people that are like, oh, cool, they were doing this this month and now I see them hosting this thing and now I see them with a new client. Let me give them some props there. So it really does become kind of an addiction. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you found it to be that way. Yeah, no, absolutely. I really love to engage with anyone and I, I stopped having a scarcity mindset around it with my, my last mentor who is essentially doing what I do and he trained me to become really good at what I do. Right? And he's essentially kind of raised a little competitor to himself and he didn't bat an eyelid doing that. You know? right. So that is he, wonderful to have been in this kind of school. And I've had also a, a real competitor be a paying client of mine. And I helped, I helped him with um, the sales process. So he was good in content, but he was not terribly good at selling. So we, we changed that. So that's totally, very cool. I totally agree. Yeah. Once you sort of learn that, that, uh, you know, training your competition uh, is, is not that scary. It's, and it, usually it's not that scary because you're six months or a year or 10 years ahead of them. So even if they get really good at it, you still are further down the road than they are. And, mm -hmm. you know, you're, you're not going to get usually outshined by anyone. And, you know, unless you're planning on building your business, your, your company to a hundred people, which most people aren't, uh, how many clients can you really handle? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, exactly. it's like we can't get all of the work. So there's yeah. plenty of stuff to go around. Exactly. Great. Chris, I wanted to ask you if we could review some videos. One of um, somebody who sent his video in, who asked to be reviewed. And then maybe if we could look at one of my recent videos and you could give your uh, critique of these. I would love to. Yeah. Love it. Let's do it. Let me just copy the link first and then we will start sharing screen. Okay. Let me do this. All right. Let's hope that the microphone is going to pick it up. And by the way, for our listeners who are only listening to this in audio, simply go to, there's going to be the YouTube link in the show notes, but you can also go to episode five, State of Client Acquisition on YouTube, where you will be able to find this uh, video as well. So you don't only have to have the audio. All right, let's get right into it. This setting in Klaviyo could potentially get you banned from email marketing. So in email marketing, we have something called a bounce. A bounce is basically when you send an email to someone and the server doesn't deliver the email. Now, there's a ton of different Do ways. Do you want to have the audio for everybody? Because I already actually watched this, so I don't know if we have to watch the whole thing. Okay, no, then, then uh, I... Yes. Well, you know what? It's short. Can we quickly just let's, let's sure. let it run? For sure. So, yeah, totally. Types of bounces, but I'm not going to explain those in this video. So in the email marketing world, an acceptable bounce rate is between 1% and 2%. If your bounce rate is too high, your sender reputation goes down. And if your sender reputation isn't good, then that means that you'll be inboxing to the spam folder a lot more often, and you can even get banned from Clavio if your sender reputation isn't high. The thing that's weird about Clavio is that Clavio will only remove someone from your email list if they bounce seven times, which is way too high. So whenever I'm setting up Clavio for one of my clients or I'm setting up a new segment, I always make sure that I use this option, which I'm about to show you. So you want to enable this okay. option. Okay, and we don't need to go into that now. So that's just, he shows the settings in this tool on how to do that. All right, Chris, your thoughts. Sure. So, um, first of all, is it Zarek? Zarek? Yeah, Zarek, uh, I think. I would say that overall, compared to a majority of video content on LinkedIn, this is actually very good. Uh, most people are not getting this in-depth and providing this much actual tangible value to people. Uh, so that's really great. Um, can, you, can you look at the comments? Mm -hmm. I just want to see what people say here. So, 
Declan says, two seem like a sensible amount. Thanks for the video, buddy. Another person, that was great. I haven't seen bounce rate as high as two to 3% in any of my campaigns and so on. So that's a substantial comment that Zarag responded to. Another one says, thanks for the information. I found it very helpful. Another person, wow, thanks. So there's, there was like, there was, there, was, there was one comment that was substantial. Right. And the other ones are very, they seem pretty legit, even if they're not super rich. Yeah. Uh, they, they don't seem totally like, you know, sometimes you get these comments and be like, great job, loved it. And you're like, you didn't even watch this, did you? You didn't read this, did you? You just yeah. want to like build this relationship. So um, that's the most important thing is look into the comments, see what people have said. Okay, that's a good sign that, that it's good. Mm -hmm. um, if we go back up, the change, the big change that I would probably make for this video is to niche down in the title or at least let's look at the description. Description. If you don't use the setting for your segments, you might be emailing hundreds of debt subscribers on a weekly basis. That's the first sentence. So that's where I would probably niche down either in the description or in the title. I don't know watching this. I still don't know. Is this for me or not? I think it's for me because I am a business owner and I do have an email list. Hmm. But I don't know if he's approaching other email marketers, if he's approaching business owners, who is this content for? Mm -hmm. And that's pretty important. Like you want to give people the option to opt in or out voluntarily pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. um, so that is probably what I would recommend doing is, you know, starting this off and saying, email marketers, here's a little tip about this. That way, because me as a business owner goes, I go, well, I'm not an email marketer, but he does seem like he's giving some good content. And I do want to learn about email marketing from the expert. I'm going to see what the email marketers are watching mm -hmm. uh, or small business owners. Like, well, I am a small business owner. So maybe I do want to learn a bit, bit more about email marketing. My opinion or my feeling on this is that he is really talking to email marketers because it does get really deep pretty quickly and goes over my head, mm. but that's fine. Just call that out. So you're not really wasting my time. If I watch this and I get nothing out of it, because ultimately I think you want the call from me. You want me to go, Hey, I don't know anything about this, but I need your help. So just respect people's time by, by creating the niche very clearly, either in the description or in the um, title. Mm -hmm. The other thing I would say is, you know, just from just a pure marketing um, kind of philosophy is you really want to keep it simple, make it as easy to digest as possible. And if you can make it a little bit fun, so the content can remain the same, but in the title or even in the description, um, make it shorter, make it maybe a little bit more poppy. So right now the, the title is use this Clavio setting to clean your segments on autopilot. Um, maybe I would change it to make clean up your emails, clean up your email list easily. And then I would just get into the content and start mm. talking about that. Okay. That gives it to me from, from my perspective, a, a really nice inroad knowing that, okay, I don't use, so like I already limited myself from this video. Cause I'm like, I don't know, I use Clavio. I don't know what he's talking about. I don't have time for this. Mm. I use MailChimp. So this is not for me, yeah. but if you make it approachable for me in a way that's kind of, there's a little bit of fun, Clearly you have like my interest in need, like, cause you want to help me by saying you want to clean up your email list. That's the problem that you want to solve. Yeah. So make it short and to the point and kind of poppy. Mm -hmm. um, well, otherwise I would say it's a great video. Is it, was there subtitles? I can't remember. Yes, there were. Okay. Yeah. That's the other thing that people don't often realize is that every video should have subtitles because 60 to 70% of people on LinkedIn are watching video with the sound off. So yeah. you really want to have those. Definitely, definitely. What do you think about his background being um, largely his bed? Not ideal, no? You know, 
the the brilliance of 2019 or 20 you know covid 20 covid 19 in 2020 <laughs> was that we all ended up working from home yeah so for all i know this guy could be making six figures doing email marketing mm-hmm. or he could be making seven figures who knows i, I have no idea mm-hmm. ceos you know, talk show hosts were all vlogging essentially from their bedrooms. They're vlogging from their homes, you know? So to me, it doesn't bother me, honestly. It really doesn't bother me um, because we all want a deal, you know? And if I think this guy's like gonna give me a deal because he's working from his bedroom, I might be more likely to call him. Yeah. Because I'm an entrepreneur, I'm savvy. I wanna, I don't wanna pick the highest priced email marketer. But if I get on the call with him, cause I think he's maybe cheaper and he proves to me on the call that he's going to save me money and it does cost a lot of money, but he's going to actually be saving me money. I'm like, cool. Mm. It is confident. He knows what he's doing. He does this from his bedroom. He's probably working in, you know, Tahiti right now for all I know. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. You know, ultimately we don't care about the production if the content is good. Okay, good. All right. So, very, very interesting stuff. I think Zarak will get a lot of value out of this. By the way, do you recommend that they should then um, always like mention the person you're trying to reach? Like in my case, it would be coaches, consultants, listen up. See, because it gets, if you have to do this every time or if it's right. not explicit, right. Right. you get a little boring, no? It really depends on... It really depends on your audience, how people are responding. So for yours, I looked at yours as well. The the title is client persona, stop ticking demographic boxes, understand their pain instead. So it's to me, in my opinion, it's too much. It's too much for me to take in. I'm scrolling through LinkedIn. I don't have time to read. I need answers. I need to be entertained, all this stuff. Mm. What I would change it probably to is understand your client's problems, not their personality, or just understand your client's problems. Mm-hmm. That gets me in and I go, okay, that's, a, that's like an entry point that I might want to learn more from you on. Um, and it's you don't really need to call out a niche there because every business person, business owner has clients and all of their clients have problems. Mm -hmm. So it really depends on how niche your audience is. Like, and and that can shift between posts. Like you might want to do a post that's like specific to um, consultants, you know, female consultants or something like that, or male consultants. Mm-hmm. And they're gonna they're gonna have different problems than each other, and so maybe you want to make a post specifically for one and not the other, and call mm-hmm. them out. And then when you when you do that, you're still gonna get some crossover. Other people be, like want to be like, well, why didn't I get included in that? Mm-hmm. You okay. know. Okay. Good. Any other uh, any other points for this particular video? That's let's watch it again real yeah. quick if we could. It's a Our short job one. Title: Seniority, Age, Sex, and so on. They're a decent starting point, but in comparison with really understanding their pains and problems, I would say they are akin to what a pirate's map in a bottle is to Google Maps. Right? It's just no comparison with in terms of precision and your ability to find details and nuance and all of that about your target client. So the the huge massive benefit of going in depth on people's pains and problems is that your positioning will be sharper and people will recognize themselves better in your marketing content. Cool. Can can we look at the description too? At the description, sure. Yeah. So it starts with educated guests, eight out of 10 B2B founders do this wrong, caring more about a prospect's identity than about their pain. Here's three stories, all true to illustrate what I mean. And then I say, then I share three stories. Okay, can you scroll all the way down? I wanted to just, just to see if you had a yeah. CTA. I don't. I usually don't add a CTA. I do one in the in the first comment where I invite people to follow the podcast and to to sign up to my mailing list. Okay. Um, Give me that the would be my, sandwich. 
was <laughs> give, me, give me the sandwich chris <laughs> that would be my only um piece of advice is to give me an easier access point to engage with you with mm -hmm. a cta that allows me to to just like a lot of you know half i would say half the time that i get comments it's from people in my network who support me who are other business owners and they help build me up validate the fact that i know what i'm talking about i've probably helped them through my content in the past and they want to build this relationship and continue to support me so you it is michael right michael i usually say michael oh michael okay i'm sorry mm -hmm. um you as Michael talking to me as Chris, like give me an access point to help you to be able to say like, I agree or I don't agree or whatever. Let me add to that conversation easily and, and give me a CTA either in the description or at the end of the video where you're like, mm -hmm. you re maybe you even record it separately and go like, so does this connect with you? Like, have you been able to uh, find your client persona by addressing their problem, or are you really looking at just the surface level stuff? I want to know if, if you've had any experience with this. Should I mention that in the video speaking or in the description writing? Either one, either one, do okay. both, it, okay. it, you know, just experiment with it. I think about 50, 50, probably of my, of my engagement, people just read the description and they don't watch the video. I'm fine with that because yeah. it's the same content. It's just served in a different way. Yeah, it's I don't do the same content. It's kind of complementary. Here, the right. I'm not in the video. I'm not sharing these three stories. The three stories support the main message of the video, right? It's just whatever. And I do, like you say, I do. I run this podcast. Also from this podcast, it was mainly you talking. But I will whatever I say that's reasonably interesting. I'm gonna uh, ask my VA to chop it up and to right. be able to share these kind of short clips. Right. Mm. So it's always complementary what I do. It's the it's the, the video and the description are complementary. But what mm. would you, could you imagine? OK, yeah, you mentioned this kind of question. Um, how has this worked for you? Have you worked more with with uh, the pain and problem or more with the demographics and just ask a question so that people can then. Yeah, it just makes it much easier for me to know what do you want from me? You know, if I can't work with you or if I'm not your ideal client, but I do want to support you in your business, uh, how can I engage in your content? That's really interesting. Thank you, Chris. And I knew <clears throat> I knew that there would be this. That's my main gold nugget for my own content. I'm sure Zarak got his. So brilliant stuff. Thank you so much. And I know we have a hard stop uh, at the hour. So I just wanted to ask you, where can people find more out about you and what kind of problems should they come to you with? Sure. Um, you can search me on LinkedIn. Feel free to follow or connect. Uh, my name is Chris Weir, W-E-I-H-E-R. Just search me. And there, I don't think there's too many others. You should find me. <laughs> my company is Cleaver Creative. You That's can check out our site at uh, clevercreates.com. Um, and yeah, feel free to just follow and uh, get in touch. And I'm always happy to talk to people. Uh, if people have questions, I'm always happy to answer them uh, at no cost. It's really great content for me. Um, so yeah, happy to connect with anybody uh, who's uh, in your network. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Chris, for taking the time. I learned a lot. I'm sure the listeners did as well, Zarak as well. So thanks so much. And uh, I hope to uh, see a lot more of your content in the future and to learn from it. Thank you. Many thanks, Michael. This was great. I, re I really had a good time. Awesome. Thanks a lot. The State of Client Acquisition is a Content360 production. Music by Gavin Knox Grand. To sign up for alerts and to submit written and audio questions, go to stateofclientacquisition.com. Unless I announce it otherwise, the live podcast is recorded on Wednesdays each week at 7 p.m. Central European Time. That's 6 p.m. UK Time, 1 p.m. Eastern and 10 a.m. Pacific. And you can always join by going to www.talktomichael.com. That's Michael without an E. But if you sign up at the podcast page, you'll get the link in an email each week. I'll talk to you in the next episode.